Welcome, Jacob Swell. It's great to be here with you today. And anybody that's kind of new here, we're just glad that you're with us. We're starting something new this week. We're starting something um, called Supernatural. And we're trying to kind of fill you in on that, but we're going to be following this all the way through Lent. And if you think about what we did these last five weeks, well, five weeks plus uh, kind of an in-between one, but we spent uh, this period of time talking about ourselves, trying to understand what it means to be a human being, what it means to be someone who's creating this world. And here with Jacob Swell, we use something called rope. And um, I've got mine in my pocket. I have a tendency to keep it with me. And th this rope is made of three strands. And there's one strand, and that's what we've been dealing with for five weeks, is the strand of ourselves. Um, because yourself needs to be healthy, it needs to be developing, it needs to be growing. We've talked about it in This Is Your Life. We talked about this is your why, that is our purpose. We talked this is your how. Um, we talked about self-honesty and being our real self. We talked about this is your hope, that healing, that ever-growing, that's becoming part of ourselves. We talked about this is your money, kind of where are we devoted, where, are we, um, where do we uh, you know, create other gods that can either help us well, gods that keep us away from God or um, other things that support us and help us uh, express our lives. And then the last we talk about this is our starfish, kind of trying to come to grips with the, our power, our influence. What is God, how has God gifted us to, to be in the world? Now, those, those are all things that we need to, uh, I think, wrestle with a lot in order to have a good self-strand to our rope. Um, but starting today and through Easter, we're going to be talking about the next strand, and that's this God strand. Um, it is a three-fold three cord that one weaves in order to put life together and that is always going on in ourselves. And just like it's important for our sense of self to be, what, mature, growing, developing, strong, so it is with our understanding of who God is. That is also a part of a life that needs to be maturing, needs to be strong, needs to be ever-growing and developing. We can't ever think we've got it figured out. And I don't think it's uh, a big leap for me to say that there's a lot of unhealthy and unhelpful concepts of God floating around out there. In fact, we all probably kind of participate in some of that ourselves all the time. And by saying that and by you know, talking about the fact that we're going to be spending up till Easter talking about this, who is God and, and so on, doesn't mean that this is all going to be about theology or doctrine. We're just trying to get your thinking straight. I think this really has real implications. Um, we, we discover... Uh, who we are by discovering who God is. And, you know, I don't think we can separate these things. There's been a lot of things done um, by a lot of people who would prefer to have their opinion of what they would like God to be like, be who God is, rather than being accountable to the wisdom of the ages, to be accountable to um, other people, to be accountable to a vision of God that um, is beyond ourselves rather than just manufactured by ourselves. I, I love Anne Lamott's um, phrase when she said, um, you can always tell you created God in your own image when your God hates all the same people that you do. And uh, I think that's really true, and we spend a lot of time doing that. And we have a lot of good examples of that, I'm afraid. You know, in the media right now, there's huge problems between um, Islamic people and non-Islamic people because there are some people within that who have taken their faith to do things that they would like to do. Um, and we can't just point a finger at people that are Muslims. I mean, I think every faith is guilty of that. We certainly have people taking Christianity uh, right in our own midst. Uh, not right here, I don't, one would hope. But I'm, we all do that, don't we? I mean, we all take our faith and we use it to judge and divide rather than to love and to include and to serve other people. So for these six weeks, we're going to be seeking to open up a conversation so that each of us can test our images of God Try them out, give them a spin around the block, and see how they can mature and grow with us. And like I said, it's not just head stuff. I really believe that this um, gets down to who we are. And maybe that's where the Bible started. So the Bible, book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, talking about the creation of God. Genesis means beginning, okay? In the first chapter, you have the creation story going on. It's not meant to be taken historically or or as a, a science lesson, it's, it's witnessing to what does God want us to know about our relationship to creation and to God and to one another. And, but in that, you get in verse 26, you get this line where God is about to make humankind, and God says, let us make humankind in our own image according to our likeness. Now, we don't look like God. That's not what this is getting at. Um, we aren't powerful or... God-like. I mean, it doesn't mean that we are like God, 
But it is saying when we are created in God's image, I think there's something being asserted there, and that is there's something that is at the heart of, what, of who God is that is reflected in us. In fact, if you pull out your outlines, if you want to follow along in those, they're on the back of your Sunday paper. There's outlines, and you can fill it in. If you don't like doing that, don't worry about it. A lot of people like to, and it's a good chance for you to put some of your own ideas down too. But you'll see this, and that says that the deepest part of God's character is reflected in us. The deepest part of God's character is reflected in us. That's why it's important for us maybe to have a, a mature sense of who God is, because that's what we're going to then start looking for in ourselves. And we can probably figure that if this is like a deep part of God, imagine how deeply it must be in us, embedded in us. Probably not just at the surface level. Probably not just some of our inclinations or our easy habits and things like that, but stuff that we're going to have to dig down for and look for and have hopes for. And I think that's some pretty important stuff. So we're going to be doing this. Now, a word about this, the title of this series, Supernatural. Yeah, God is supernatural. But there's a problem with that because, you know, I think, you know, supernatural has all to do with this spooky, kind of weird, strange kind of stuff. It's stuff that's very distant, bizarre, not normal to our human experience. And, um, you know, and I think we do a disservice with that. I think we put God in such a different place that for God to interact with us and be part of our world makes our world like just too weird. And so a lot of us, have, frankly, we just reject God because of that. So rather than this series being supernatural, it's really supernatural. Get the difference? Right? Not supernatural, but supernatural. Because I think that's where we find God. God is so real. God is so much part of the world that God is actually supernatural. So um, uh, that's what I want to kind of dive into here. One of the things that we talk about here at Jacob's Well, and you've heard me use this language a lot, but maybe I never really unpacked it too much, but we talk about the fabric of existence that we are a part of and that God has given us. And let me just kind of share with you um, what we mean by that. And that is that God in creation, and, I'm, and when I say God creation, I'm not necessarily talking about any way that God created, whether it's snapping fingers or just speaking or or whether it was uh, you know, a billions and billions year process that to us would look very natural, that would maybe fit with supernatural, wouldn't it? Um, but that's not where I'm trying to go. What I'm trying to go is in, in creation, God wove this textile, this fabric that we are a part of, so with such, what, profundity, with such greatness, with such complexity. And we as human beings kind of live on the top layer of it. And uh, because we're human beings, we can't see real deep down inside of it. We don't really know what's going on. We kind of think we do because we're sort of seeing the surface level, maybe a little bit below that. And we kind of think that that's the world, but really it's just kind of the stuff that we're walking on. It's kind of like walking over a frozen lake in the wintertime thinking, is this a nice platform, not realizing the life and all the stuff that's underneath us the whole time. Because we're human beings and we perceive existence, um, from a, a narrow, from a superficial, and from a short-term perspective. And I use those words very deliberately. Narrow, meaning that we, we just can't think broadly enough. We don't include enough. We don't include enough you know, geographically in our experience, I mean, even beyond the world, right? Um, we don't include enough experientially, culturally, any of that. We're so narrow, we just, you know, the greatest among us, our scope is really pretty myopic. Superficial. Uh, we just can't handle how complex this world is. We don't think deeply enough. We don't think complexly enough. So we, we try to make things easy. You know, we find the sound bite. We find the way we can package it and hang on to it, which is, you know, that's what we have to do. Short-term perspective. The short-termness means we're very immediate. Um, we don't see um, ourselves in the uh, historical, the, you know, the sense of the past, the historical precedents that have led us to the point we are, nor do we see into the future far enough to really understand who we are and what our actions are, what our behaviors are, what our opinions actually mean and how the effect that they have in this world. So because of that, um, you know, we just don't have a real good view of really who we are in this world. Now, that isn't a bad thing. That's simply who we are. And it's simply also why we need another strand in our rope. Because that's a part of our presence in the world that we can't supply ourselves and we need to rely on, well, I'm going to say God, to help us out with that. 
All right? Uh, the, the Bible talks about this in lots and lots of ways. Maybe the most transparent is Paul, this guy who's kind of spreading this news of Jesus around the known world of his time. He's, he's speaking to the early church, and he says, um, I mean, he's thinking, okay, I need you to get beyond your narrow, superficial, short-term view of the world, and I need you to be infected with how God sees it. And this is, this, this is what he says. He says, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints, all those who are trying to follow Christ, what is the breadth, what is the length, what is the height, what is the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. I, just a testimony that we only get so much, and we need to get stretched. We need to see more that height and width and that depth. So God, then, on the other hand, is inexhaustible. You know, for a lack of better terms, I would just say, you know, when it comes to existence, God gets it. God knows what's going on. God can see how things interrelate. So while we are narrow, superficial, short-term, God perceives existence broadly, deeply, and I'm going to use the word eternally. All right? I know that's a loaded word. All right? If that means heaven for you, fine, but that's not where I'm going with it. I'm talking about God sees what? I, I, don't, I don't even know how to talk about it because it's something God does and I can't. But God understands the now in, in respect to the larger picture of time and space. So we'll never get it, not completely. But we have those moments of insights. We have those glimpses of the big picture. We have those times when we see a little deeper down in the fabric where things are coming from and how they work. Um, you know, those moments that we sense, we can kind of recall how we feel about them but we have a difficulty recreating them afterwards. In fact, we have a real hard time even holding on to what it was like. They're very fleeting. Those experiences are kind of well beyond our pay grade. Um, but we get them, and we're there for a moment, and, and they kind of glow like embers in our lives that we hang on to, and we remember them, and they inspire us, and they give us hope, and that's good stuff. God lives there um, in Psalms. The psalmist is reflecting on God, who sees so much more than the psalmist does, and says, even the darkness isn't dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. God's not limited. So, you know, that's good stuff. Um, John Ellis, who's a Jacob's Well guy, I haven't seen him here. Where is he? Someone give him a call. Tell him to get over here. No. <laughs> anyway, but I was talking to him, and he says, you know, it's like we human beings, we're like Commodore 64s. And does that mean anything to anybody? Do you have to be like over 35 to know that? This is a Commodore 64, yeah. And it plays great games, has five and a quarter inch floppy disks, and it's operated like people like that. Just the coolest stuff in the world, you know. So that, that's kind of us, you know, cool. But um, we've got our limits. And uh, God, on the other hand, is like this. A, a liquid nitrogen-cooled cray titan computer and with a display screen like this and i have no idea what he's doing but um so so you can imagine how you might have a little bit of a trouble of that commodore 64 figuring out what that um cray um titan is handling yeah um so that you know I, I think that's part of the situation how we see god being woven so deeply into the fabric of existence and us sort of sitting on the top and so God is a part of what we're doing, and God makes sense, and God is natural to what we're doing, but our ability to understand that and to work with that is pretty limited sometimes. So, but the big question then, I think, that comes up to us, and if you start, you're probably thinking a little ahead of me, is, okay, so you're saying God is part of the world this way, but how is God involved? Well, let me, here's a what if for you. What if the supernaturalness of God came from God being so, um, so deeply natural to our world and to our existence that it surpassed our ability to understand it or perceive it? It wasn't because God is so out of our reality, but so deeply embedded in it that it's unfathomable to us, even though it is utterly natural to it. So historically, and this is where the uh, title for this week comes, the painter or the coder, but um, there was a time when, uh, there were, and obviously we still have these kinds of thoughts, it's something called pantheism. That is where God is in everything and God is everything. 
And the early church fathers said, oh, we can't have people believe in that because that's not how it works. And so to get rid of that, they created a, um, a way of thinking about God that has been very popular and been around for a long, long time, and it's God as the painter. You maybe have heard this, where God is the painter. You can think of Van Gogh, all right? And the painter paints paintings and does them with great beauty and great insight, with all kinds of heart and passion, and paints them. And the painting then also reflects a lot of the painter. Um, you can start seeing things. If you look in the detail, I'm going to pop ahead another picture there. So here's a painting and a Van Gogh. And as you start looking into it, you can start seeing the brush strokes, and you can learn about the painter and, and uh, what the painter thought about colors and was trying to do with colors. And and um, the techniques and stuff the, the painter is using. So by looking at the painting, you can learn a lot about the painter, but here's the big thing with this idea is the painter is not the painting. The painter painted the painting, but isn't the painting, isn't in it, and isn't it. All right? So, um, you know, maybe you can uh, see some important things like that, not confusing creation with God. But the problem is that this separates God and creation too much, doesn't it? I mean, isn't that just like too artificial? Isn't that too distant? I mean, where does God? So if God wants to do something, the only way that God can do it is to come under with a knife and scrape away some of the paint and, and redo it. I mean, that's like an invasion. That's this enormous interruption. That's not natural anymore. Um, because of that kind of idea, well, I don't know because of that, in line with it, there's this thing that I call gap theology. Not that kind. But um, this gap theology, and we all practice it sometimes. I catch myself in it every once in a while, too. But it is, this is, in the United States, I can't speak for other cultures, but in the United States, this is the popular culture among people who would call themselves Christians. All right? Intentionally or not intentionally. And this is how it works. You, I invite you to think about some things where you call on God or where you look for God or where you think you see God, and just try this out and see where you find out maybe you kind of fall into this trap yourselves. So it works like this. Gap theology is, um, um, so the screen represents everything, totality. I know you can't put everything in a finite space, but just play with me, all right? All right, so that screen represents all of everything. And in the, in the, among that everything is a circle, and that is the stuff that we know, that we feel comfortable with, that is under our control. Now, in different times in human history, that's, that little circle has been smaller or bigger. And everything outside of that circle is the unknown. And that's kind of scary. That's the stuff that we don't know about. And certainly for a lot of people and for a lot of human history, um, that unknown was so big and people felt so subject to it, whether it was the weather, whether it was warring tribes, whether it was who knows what, you know, illnesses and things like that, Guess what people call the unknown? God. So what do you have? You've got a universe all full of stuff. There's the stuff we know, and then there's God. Now, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, you know, the stuff we know, like, you know, I know how to arrange chairs. I don't need God to help me arrange chairs here in the morning. Um, but there's other things that I don't know. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know if uh, when I go to the doctor next time, I'm going to be okay or not. If I'm gonna, the doctor's going to find something wrong with me that I'm not aware of, so there I turn to God and say, God, I need you to help me with that because that's an unknown. All right? So what happens, though, is uh, as we grow, as we mature as individuals or as a society, what happens to the known? It gets bigger, right? It gets bigger. And what happens when it gets bigger? The unknown becomes smaller, therefore God gets smaller, and it keeps going until God becomes really little, and face it, at this point you realize, I mean, hey, you're a smart person. You realize that God was simply a placeholder for what you didn't know. And it's only a matter of time. We may never know everything, but we can see the handwriting on the wall. There is no such thing as God. There's just stuff we haven't figured out yet. And God was a placeholder for it. So at that point, we just dismiss God, and we realize, well, we just don't know everything yet. We maybe never will, but that's all there is. There's the stuff you know and the stuff you don't know. Does that sound at all familiar to any of you? Do you ever practice that? Intentionally, unintentionally? So this next slide, then, is how I would encourage you to see it. Our universe is made up of things we know and things that we don't know. And God is God of all of it. God is happy for what we know. 
God is happy that science has been able to explain that there's a way to fight malaria because guess what? We save lives. And God says, amen, you finally figured it out. You know, I wasn't, you know, like people that got over it before, it wasn't because I did something magic, it's that they happened to have the right antibodies, that's all. Now you've figured out what antibodies are. And you can start helping other people have them. That's good. You know, you're working with me. Thank you. So, you know, God is not threatened by science. God rejoices when we learn things. God rejoices when we grow and we mature and we understand the world better. Um, we're more able to be co-creators with God when we are mature, when we handle that kind of stuff. So that's, you know, that's really good stuff. Um, but we do do it all the time. One of my favorite examples, I, I've been waiting to be able to use this when I was preaching, when I heard it a couple weeks ago, my staff is all going to grow and my family is all going to grow, but I'm going to say it anyway. So this guy, he's never gone to church in his life, right? Yeah, well, at least not in his adult life. And he's got a really important interview downtown, and so he's getting there, and it was bad traffic, so he's like really almost late for his appointment. He's really nervous because he cannot be late for this interview, and there's nowhere to park. And so, so he's you know, driving around frantically, and he finally he just gives in. He says, God... You know, I know I don't go to church, but if you find me a parking space, I will go to church every week for the rest of my life. And sure enough, like right then, this car pulls out and he jumps in and he immediately says, oh God, never mind, I found one. <laughs> yeah, you can think about that. See, what if, what if God wasn't what we didn't understand and science was what we do but all things were of God, and science is a way of understanding all things. Whether, you, whether we can understand it yet or we don't understand it yet, science, too, is a part of God's creation. Um, the filling on your outline is, God doesn't explain what is unknown. God is part of everything. God is not not an explanation for what we don't know. God is simply part of everything. Um, you have, a, on the bottom of your outline, you'll find a homework question. I invite everyone to spend a little bit of time thinking about this week, this week. Just just take 10 minutes sometime. Um, think about the question. Jot down a few notes. Like I always say, if you're in group life, do this before your group life gathering because it'll kind of speed things up for you at that point. But the question is simply this. Des describe a time that you dismissed God because you felt in control or knew what to do. And then describe a time when you turn to God because you didn't have control or know, what, or know what to do. How can you include God in all of those times? And what would that look like? What would that change about how you live? Okay, so that's all God the, God the painter. And you may have realized that there's some good insights there, but basically I'm kind of wanting to push that off to the side. And the uh, image of God that I want to suggest, which again is just a metaphor and it's not perfect, is God the coder. Yeah, you know, the programmer, that guy or gal. Um, any, it doesn't matter. So God is sort of like a computer, uh, computer programmer. God put together this most amazing, most dynamic, interactive creation um, and, and there's possibility in it, there's potential built into it, but it isn't all determined. I mean, the, the components in it are actually going to interact and make the software produce what it's going to produce. All right, it's, it's not known from the very beginning. And what's really fascinating is that the programmer wrote the code to include her or himself in it. All right, now, stepping away from the metaphor a little bit, God created the universe to include God's continued input. There is a layer deep within the programming, deep within this fabric of creation that allows God to be involved. It isn't scrapping the program. It isn't you know, having to uh, take off part of the painting and redo it. No, it's actually part of the operation of our universe that God is deeply woven God's own self right into it. God's input belongs to the program. It's natural to it, even though it may be so much deeper and have so, so much greater omniscience about what is going on in the program um, that that perspective just mystifies us and we can't quite understand how it's happening or where it's happening or where it's coming from or what it really looks like. Now, there's another element to this, another layer of depth to it, and that is God isn't only fascinated by this computer program and what it creates, 
checking in, you know, playing with it a little bit and stuff like that. But God chooses to be subject to it as well, to be a full participant. That means not only affecting it, but being affected by it. And I'm going to talk about that in two notable ways, all right? Two notable ways are God chose, not only finds a way to be connected with and involved with, but actually asks to be subject to it. And, and I think these are really important. First of all, God is connected to our world by caring. God actually cares, right? God loves his creation. This isn't the matrix, all right? It isn't an illusion, all right? That, the metaphor falls apart if you start going there with it, all right? It's a metaphor. Um, but God created us. We are a reality. And this reality matters, and God seems to feel responsible for it. God rejoices in our victories, weeps with our problems and our losses, and God always hopes and tugs and leads where God can, but refuses to take control because God respects us too much and never loses hope. The Bible talks about this a lot, like this, where it says, Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. God is connected to this world, to the creation, because God really cares about it. That's one way God gets messy with, and involved with the world. Here's the other. This is the big one. God is not only connected to, but part of the world through Jesus. Now, this is a big leap. This is a faith claim, but let me tell you what I mean by that. God, or Jesus, is God putting skin in the game. God knew it wasn't fair to say, you got this dynamic creation and sometimes things don't go so well and you guys pay a huge price and I feel bad about that and I kind of keep messing with it. You know, I've got my way of being involved in the program too to try to help and pull you up, but I can't take control. I mean, that, God says, that, that just won't do. I mean, that's making them have to pay all this price and I just sit out here and, and witness. And God says, I can't do that. I have to be subject to it too. If they're carrying pain and loss, I'm going to carry it too. I'm going to know what it means to be one of these people I love. I don't want them to have to bear burdens that I don't bear. I don't want them even to be able to experience the wonder of love and of acceptance and not experience it. I need to be a part of this world from them. I need them to know that I truly care. I care enough to be there. I care enough to take it on myself. I, know, I need to know what you feel and what you are suffering. Paul, again, writing, says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. In other words, this is the mind of Christ Jesus here, that even though he was in the form of God, he emptied himself. He poured himself out, being born in human likeness. God becoming one like us, one of, one of us. Now, that's a faith statement, and by that, I mean I can't prove it. I can't expect you to buy that, believe that, so I don't. But my experience with this world, my experience with God, leads me to sense that this is how it's working. It makes me, helps me sense that what this life really is all about are these things like trust and hope in love and forgiveness and sacrifice and generosity, things that seem kind of wimpy when you just stack them up on the powers of this world, but when you really get down to it and you really realize what your life is about and you have those ember experiences where you do feel and experience what is woven deep down into the fabric of this world, those are the things you feel. You don't feel your bank account. You don't feel how big your house is or how many boats you own. You feel loved. You feel accepted. That's what your significance, that's what, you've dis, that's what you realize is, this world is really all about when you, what, exceed your pay grade. When you start getting those glimpses of what God is trying to show you. Which makes me think that this is where the heart of God is as well. This is what God really wove this world around and this is where God is also to be found among us and with us and sharing in it. 
stuff to think about. Okay, so what does all this coder and not a painter mean? I mean, a lot of theory, Greg, a lot of, lot of talk, a lot of, lot of descriptions, but what does it actually change for me and for my experience with God and maybe the way I would live my life? Let me give you a theoretical, well, a practical example. A theoretical, practical example. Okay. Um, prayer. A couple extreme ex um, ways that we perceive prayer. One is God answers prayers, right? I got something wrong, so I pray to God, and God will either do it for me or not, or say wait, or one of those kinds of subtle responses. That's one thing, all right? I've got a problem, or I've got something big, I want God to help me with it. Another view of prayer is, nah, it doesn't work that way. Prayer is contemplation. We sit down, you think, you meditate, you come to grips with things within your own reality and make peace, but really God isn't a part of it. This is just something that you do and that goes on in your inner self. And we, we say that's God, but that's really just us. There's those two extremes of it. Either it's all up to God or it's all up to us. Maybe there's more. I mean, is there something in between all that? So you've been sitting here listening to me to an embarrassingly long amount of time. And you're all smart, intelligent people, and you've been here, you've heard my words and probably understand more or less what I have said. But you've, you've done more than that as well. You've also picked up some other things. You've uh, understood some things that I'm talking about um, because of, you know, picking up some of the nonverbals, maybe the stresses on words, maybe inflections and turns of phrases that have communicated things. Um, maybe you've also picked up things from the people sitting around you. Maybe someone around you nodding their head or, <laughs> or shaking their head. Um, you know, but those things, too, have probably informed how you're doing things. Maybe you kind of know me well enough to be able to read between the lines. Um, you say, okay, I kind of know where Greg is coming from, or I, I know some other experiences that, that uh, help me understand what he's saying and um, where he's going with all this. Uh, you know, maybe it helps you... Uh, kind of just the whole experience of knowing the community, you have, your intuition is at work. And, or maybe you know, you're able to tell the difference between when I'm really making a point or when I'm just giving you information or when I'm in my own feeble way trying to make a joke or something like that. But these are all things that weren't communicated on the surface level of it, were they? Those are things that were woven down a little bit more deeply, but we pick them up and we understand them. And in fact, they completely change what you experienced and what you heard and what you're taking away and all of it was kind of messy, wasn't it? I mean, how did that really happen? How did that work? How did you learn all those things? And sure, you know, I know you can say, well, you already named it. Those are the nonverbals. Those are, you know, all those things. Human intuition teaches us. Great, fine. How does that work? How do you do that? How are you aware of all those things all at once? And how does the holding of my hand or the raising of my voice or the person next to you sitting back in their chair and folding their arms or leaning forward with their elbows on their knees, how does that somehow give more meaning to you in what you're hearing? Explain that to me. I don't think we can. Back to the fabric of existence concept, okay? Those nonverbals, all that other kind of communication, all that intuitive sort of stuff is woven, it's real, and we can rely on it pretty well, can't we? It's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty good. But it's a little deeper down in the fabric of existence, isn't it? Beyond where we can really see and understand easily, but it's there, and it guides us. It's natural. It's real. So what if, deeper still, layers deeper, spread throughout the fabric, God is in touch. God is communicating as well. God is involved as well. Below our consciousness and our ability to understand, God is there. And maybe it works more like the beauty of a sunset than reading information about a subject on Wikipedia. Maybe it's something that happens and if you didn't know you were listening to it, you would hear it, but never know it was said. But because, you know, God is God, we assume that from God it needs to be a bolt of lightning. It needs to be interruptive. It needs to be unnatural, abnormal, supernatural. And, but what God is doing, perhaps, is so well woven, so supernatural, 
that we just miss it most of the time. We hear God's voice, we experience God's tug in our hearts, we feel God's guidance, and we ignore it as just another random thought that crosses our minds. Just another thought that maybe if we do take it, we just assume it was ours, and God says, that's fine, I just wanted you to get it. What if you've never been out of touch with God? What if you've been hearing God's voice, experiencing God's love all along, but you were missing it because you assumed that, it, that if it were God, it wouldn't be so normal? But God chose to be that normal. I kind of want to leave you with that thought. There's a story in the Old Testament, hundreds and hundreds of years before the time of Jesus, this man named Elijah, he's a prophet, He's in a lot of trouble. He's been speaking the word of God and getting in a lot of trouble for that. Surprise, surprise, huh? And uh, chapter 19 of 1 Kings, Elijah's on the run. Everybody's chasing him. They're trying to kill him. He goes up Mount Horeb and he hides in a cleft in the rock. And he's waiting for God to show up to save him. And the, the story tells us this. First of all, he's, he knows God's going to come, right? So first of all, there's this enormous wind that comes and it blows over trees and tears rocks apart and everything. And he's looking for God and it says God wasn't there. And then there's an earthquake shattering the mountain, shaking the mountain, and rocks are falling and everything again. He says, oh, finally God has arrived. God wasn't in the earthquake. And then a fire comes over the mountain, burning things up. Again, all this huge, great, powerful stuff. God wasn't in the fire. Why are you God? And then... After the wind, after the earthquake, after the fire, there's this line in Hebrew that you can't really translate. And in Hebrew, it's kol de mama de cha. And it, the best way maybe to describe, it's the sound of sheer silence. Elijah heard something without hearing anything. And there was God. And God said, what are you doing up here? He says, I'm in trouble, I need you. He says, you know what to do. You've been doing it your whole life. Go back down the mountain, keep doing it. What are you waiting for to hear God? Where are you looking for God? Does God have to be that strange? Does, do you have to not believe in God? Do you have to discount the idea of faith because it's too irrational, because it doesn't make sense, because somehow it would make us defy the laws of physics? Maybe God is just that still, small voice, that sound of sheer silence that is with us always, so deeply woven in the world that it speaks truth and beauty and hope and love like we seldom find it anywhere else. Would you join me in a word of prayer? God, you know, we talk to you now and... Um, it always feels a little bit funny, but we don't need any special language. We don't need any special formulas. We don't know how to do it right. It, you know, you're way beyond that. You're way below that. You're so much deeper down in it. So we just give you our hearts right now. Our hearts that are looking for more in this world, but hanging on to what we've got. Help us to see the you that always is and always will be, and is with us now. And help us to learn to trust that. Help us to point it out to others and to share this hope that we have found and this direction that we have, even though it's really hard to close our fists tightly around it without it leaking between our fingers. So thank you for being with us. And thank you for caring. And thank you for being one of us. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, but just as I walked up, two people stopped me and said, Greg, you've missed some fill-ins. And those are the nerdy ones among you. Um, <laughs> and I said, I know. Those are for the end. So one of the things I really love about Jacob's Well is that you guys really think, and you're here for a reason. You're not just here to be told what you're supposed to believe or what you're supposed to do, but this means something to you. And you, like God, want skin in the game and are trying to figure this out. But nonetheless, I have my pitching mound, and I get to stand up here at, at the uh, middle of the diamond and throw balls across your plates, and you get to decide how you're going to swing on them. But I want you to know something from my pitching mound that's very important to me. 
and that I would encourage you to be thinking about this week, and that is these things. Number one, expect God to exist. You know, even though you have no idea what that means or how it works, expect God to exist. Second is expect God to care. You, individually you, as well as everything in this universe, are precious to God. God cares. The third is expect to be connected to God. Not abandoned by, not controlled by, connected. And start discovering where that happens. The last one is expect that there is more. There is more to life. There's more to this world. There's more to your understanding than you will ever, ever begin to know. And that world is pretty good and pretty great. So if you want God in your life, good. God wants in there too. Let God be more supernatural than supernatural. And you might give God a break. You might give God a chance. And that's what I would like you to be working on. And we will see you next week. Thank you, Jacob Swell. Amen. <laughs>